Now, for the next hour, I am really excited and I'm really thankful for, for your time. We have uh, the new superintendent of schools. Um, Ryan Sachs. Ryan Sachs. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it, Ryan? <laughs> welcome to Berkeley County. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Mike. <laughs> Ryan, welcome in, and, and I really appreciate you uh, giving us a, a full hour to chat. Um, first of all, welcome, and how is it? How's your first week, two weeks been? Well, they've been uh, phenomenal. Um, you know, being able to. Uh, start meeting the wonderful people um, within Berkeley County has just been so rewarding. Uh, I've been able to meet many of our principals um, briefly, uh, but also our, some of our teachers. Um, I've been able to work with uh, district office staff, our local board, and then of course um, I have a great realtor that's uh, trying to help me too. And so, um, are you, you know, renting for now? Well, I, I am staying in a hotel. Doing the hotel life. Okay. Um, my wife and I, um, we have our home in Cabell okay. that uh, is under contract and will be closing very soon. So we will have to probably be doing some short-term rental for the family um, in the next couple And is your years. wife back home still, back home in Cabell, still kind of tying up? Yep, yep. So we have two little boys, and so we're trying to make the transition as um, stressless on them as possible. And my wife. Right. <laughs> and how old are the boys? Uh, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old uh, named Hampton and a uh, six-year-old, Paul. Okay, so yeah. Paul will be going into the school system. Yeah, Paul's going to be here. He's he's ready to uh, – he, he's going into first grade, so we're really excited uh, to get him transitioned up here. Yeah, and, yeah so. that's exciting. So what what does the first few days look like for a new superintendent? What What is the – is it a bunch of meetings with meeting people, or, or is it – how do you start – getting into what you want to do well i think the first thing is is that um you know uh, you have experiences in other places that give you some context of how you'd like to see things um and but the, but this but it's really important to come and just learn what what's working what's not uh and that you do that by meeting people building relationships, uh, finding out what their passions are, what, what initiatives do they have going on. Um, you also, you're also learning where, where some of the areas are that perhaps they feel that some improvement can be made. Um, and of course, you know, working with the board, um, because the board, you know, they are, um, you know, they're elected by the people. And uh, so they have constituents they need to be able to respond to. So making sure that I understand where uh, board desires are um, and moving the district forward as well. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of, but it's also analyzing and researching um, historical information as it relates to uh, student achievement data. Um, you know, uh, how, how are we in making sure that we're prepared to start the first day of school with our in all of our classrooms being appropriately staffed? Um, so a lot of it is, is is learning that information, and then in some instances, you know, you're having to make you know, very quick decisions on big things just so that we can be prepared for the first day of school for students and making sure that we have professional development in place for our staff as they return, um, as well as making sure that our staff has time that when they get back to work that they have time to be able to prepare their classrooms and uh, meet families and those sort of things. Bill. Yeah. Uh, Ron, nice to meet you. Uh, and when you came in, like with every new individual coming into an area, uh, you came in with some uh, uh, some praise and also some uh, some criticism credit and let me see if i i'm going to try to frame this the way i said uh and i'm not going i have some questions i want to build upon this from uh you were in cabell county you were uh, recognized for turning around some poor performing schools and moving up in the ranking a very substantial amount so another in five six seven years uh you made some significant improvement uh within the school systems on the criticism uh, the critical side or the criticism side uh during a very tight funding year uh you decided to pull some money back from Parks and Rec and from the library that has historically been given to those two, saying that the real priority resided with the schools. And that caused a firestorm and everybody was critical of you. Uh, we in Berkeley County do not have that 
Parks and Rec funding issue. Uh, so I, I hope I framed that right. Yeah. Uh, now if, uh, but my question is, from Cabell County, with the improvements you made in those schools, what is the unique differences between Cabell County and what you're going to see in Berkeley County? And I'm thinking one thing being border state with the competition of Virginia and uh, and and uh, in Maryland. Yeah. Well, first, I, I, I want to recognize that the achievements that were accomplished in Cabell um, was not because of Ryan Sachs alone. Uh, we had a phenomenal team of uh, people that were all headed in the right same direction. There was continuity. Um, I, I, I would say that uh, over the, the last seven years and the commonality of what it was in Cabell and what will be here in Berkeley is my focus is, is that from the boardroom to the classroom, we have to be focused on what is, is going to be best for student learning and making decisions on what's best for students. And uh, that theme resonated um, across the district. We were all in alignment and it took a team to be able to accomplish those um, those. Uh, Accolades, um, and and then of course I would I would love the opportunity to be able to speak to you a little bit more about the 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 um, the situation in which you were referencing as it related to the park and library um, uh, funding, but I think what is going to be common uh, from Cabell and into Berkeley is is absolutely making sure that we get the the right players in place that we're all headed in the same direction, that uh, we're in complete alignment from the boardroom to the classroom. And then what that means is, is that the whether it be at, at within the, the Board of Education and our board meetings, to the district office uh, support staff, to our principals, assistant principals, counselors, teachers, service personnel, um, that we are all understanding what our, what, um, the the goals are what the mission is and what it is that we're hoping to accomplish and so getting that into alignment um, i think obviously the challenges that are different you know in uh, cabell we had marshall university right there in our back door that had a um, an education program uh, obviously we have universities up here that are also providing teacher prep programs but um that was a, a really good resource and the surrounding states ohio and kentucky while they paid a little bit more um, than in Cabell, um, Cabell was able to uh, increase compensation to a, a, a point where we were absolutely very competitive. And the other unique thing was in Cabell, one of the highest paid counties in the entire state, which was Putnam, was our neighboring county to the to the uh, east. And uh, we were able to be competitive with, with Putnam. I think one of the things that we really focused on though is because a lot of the research will say, well, salary is a huge component. It's also how you, how you take care of your people. How do you make sure that you have a culture where all of your staff members uh, and your employees feel that they're rewarded in their job, that they um, are um, uh, respected in their positions? And we really tried to create that culture within Cabell. Um, and I think that that will absolutely have to um, transfer into what we need to accomplish in Berkeley. Um, obviously, the surrounding states pay a significant amount more, and that is a very um, big challenge. That has this is not new. Uh, obviously, this is something you all have been working on for years. Um, and so, I think that trying to find solutions to the pay issue, uh, because that's a huge, huge facet of it, but also making sure that. Um, our staff feel valued in the work that they're doing each and every single day in serving our families um, and our students. So was Cabell um, a growth county per se? Like were you experiencing the number of students increasing every year? Because that's yeah. typically what happens in Berkeley County, right? We were, we were quite opposite. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. When when I uh, started as superintendent seven years ago, we probably we had somewhere around, uh, it was 12,500, uh, maybe 12,700 students, and uh, we were we were down to about 11,300 this past year. And so we had a declining population. Um, while which is uh, pretty much standard around the state, except yeah. for maybe two, 
Manitou County. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. As far as student population. Yeah, and so, you know, when you have students leaving, um, and, and all, some of it was because of, um, you know, people moving out of the area. Um, some of it was because of birth rates. Um, uh, other parts of it were because of, you know, Hope Scholarship. Um, so those types of things absolutely affected enrollment. And obviously that affects state aid, that affects other other things. And then, of course, you know, and, and I know Berkeley has is, is experienced this as well, but um, you had the pandemic and then you have more. And, of course, Huntington was the epicenter of the opioid epidemic. So we had a huge influx of needs for uh, meeting um, students with special needs and so um, finding more more staff to address less students was sort of a problem that we had to try to uh, tackle let's pick up on the staff side it's awfully easy for a monday morning quarterback to look at a situation come up with a solution one of the solutions of us monday morning quarterbacks have you've got too many people in the in your home in your school office Mm -hmm. uh, how do you assess that? How do you assess the number of folks you have with the job you have to get done? Yeah, so I think, well, first of all, I think that the most important job in any school district um, is the, the boots on the ground, the teachers and the service personnel uh, working with our students. Uh, but I think it's also fundamentally important that those, those um, staff members have the appropriate supports um, in order to do their job the best that they can. And um, so when it, when it comes to district level staffing, um, I think that it, e it is easy to always add there um, and not be reflective of the efficiency in which you're offering services. So, you know, part of my transition plan um, is to be able to listen and learn over the next semester um, and then take a look at how are our assets uh, allocated. When I talk about assets, I'm talking about our people. And are we operating in the, in the most efficient way possible, um, in the most effective way possible? We go back to everybody and being in complete alignment. Um, and then I think we, we have to be able to say, okay, are we getting the job done in this area or are we a little bit uh, flush in this area? And then, and then we have to make some tough decisions. Um, some, of them, some of them can be easy decisions because you can handle, handle through attrition, those sort of things. But when it affects people's jobs, you know, um, I think we owe it to everybody to make sure that we are um, being fair and consistent and making the best plan for our, again for our students and we communicate with them this is why the change is being made we always hear that our clearly that our teachers our service personnel um, need higher salaries for the first time this year i've seen on social media at least three of my friends who are in the teaching profession have gofundme pages to um so they can equip their classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that is that where we're going in education nowadays? Well, or? I, cer I certainly hope not. Um, I, I do, th and I don't know. I'll be honest with you. To be completely transparent, I don't know how much funding the district provides for you know teachers through faculty senate, uh, through you know supplies at the school level. Um, I'm sure that's in place. I just don't have that information. Mm -hmm. But I will say I'm going to I'm going to use a, a Cabell reference if you if you if you don't mind. So in Cabell, um, we supplemented um, uh, the the faculty faculty senate funding for well they had faculty senate funding and then we provided a supplement to each classroom teacher to be able to provide classroom supplies and those sort of things. And in fact, in in Cabell, one of the things that we tied to the excess levy was school supplies. We didn't want any family to have to go out and buy you know, resources for their students. And so um, we, we had those things in place. There is paperwork that's involved in some of those things too. So when you're gonna use and you're gonna spend, let's say you need, you know, um, uh, flexible seating in your class, you wanna try some innovative seats or you wanna be able to purchase some marker boards or, or crayons or those sort of things, you know, there's a purchase order process that you have to go through. So there's some red tape and so one of the things that we found is, is that we had staff members that were doing the GoFundMe or the, um, uh, there's, a, there's another site out there where they can put their, their Amazon wish list that mm -hmm, people can purchase mm -hmm. it and it goes right to the teacher. 
that's actually an easier process for, for them to get the supplies they need than having to file a requisition and a purchase order and then have to have it ordered and then it's shipped and those sort of things. So um, one of the things that we tried to do in, in Cabell was uh, there was a, a system where either if the teacher used their own money to purchase something, that they could submit the receipts electronically and then it would autom- then it would it would pay them quicker but you could also order the supplies through this online provider um, and the online provider had the amount of money that was allocated to that classroom so they could just order what they needed and it, it streamlined that process so to answer your question i think that there is there is resources and there is the funding to be able to help teachers get what they need in their classroom but sometimes it's the red tape that can because their time is valuable and if it's easier to go and say hey i have a couple extra things i would like to have then um then they may do that i think it's also about if if you if you have 300 dollars to be able to purchase classroom supplies for the year and you know that we have these social media platforms where people are willing to donate then why not ask you know so I, I i think it's important that we make sure that when we do that that it's not that the money's not available and it's just supplementing maybe what and i think i think that's the key it's just sort of the messaging the optics yep. that surround that it's kind of like well they're not getting what they need and um you know that's yep. terrible Absolutely, so yeah. of course i'm gonna give fifty dollars for you know whatever it is you need well and it's interesting you say that because even my wife and i you know um are some of our our uh, friends that are teachers you know we'll see that it, it was in even in Cabo. it was like we have some friends that were teachers and we would see that and my wife would go well, i just i just bought a couple things and i was like uh, okay <laughs> but even though i know that that you know the resources are there but it it also supplements what they're looking for too sure so. sure the uh, state board of education uh, report on north middle school recently sh- shown the spotlight on berkeley county and from that we saw some academic uh rankings whereas we in and especially the middle and high school rank below the state average, which is below, far below the national average. Uh, so we have the discipline problem. We have the academic standing problem. Uh, I'm sure you've looked at these issues prior to coming here. Uh, do you have a sense, of, and I understand also there's been a new principal uh, recently appointed mm-hmm. in North Middle School. Uh, how do you go about uh, addressing these major issues, uh, foot on the ground, running as soon as you come on board? You ha- Listen, it doesn't matter. You have to operate every single day with a sense of urgency. Um, that, and, and really, as it relates to district office staff, I can tell you the board is. The board has a sense of urgency. Um, the, uh, the district staff, and I have, I've worked with them for the past you know, 15 days. There is a sense of urgency in the in the in the district level leadership um, to write write these issues, um, and I think um, again the, the the buy-in to getting these things fixed it's there. Um, it's just it's just doing it and uh, making sure that. Um, any kind of the, I hate to go back to it, but any kind of the red tape or the bureaucracy to get it done has been eliminated, and that's what we've really tried to accomplish. We tried to make sure that that the um, the support for North Middle is in place from a, a professional development, from making sure that um, our teachers have uh, embedded professional development support, not like you're pulling out of the classroom to have a sit and get. We want to make sure that um, that there's embedded professional development to help help them. The, the new principal, Mr. Uh, Pitsnoggle, I think is going to do a fantastic job in being able to build positive relationships with the staff and the students that will help create a culture of learning, a culture of high expectations. And um, I know that we're going to be able to accomplish that. And uh, but but you're right, high school high school academic performance um, performance are really you know across the school district. Um, and even in Cabell, you know, we talked about improvements there, but we were nowhere near where we, we need to be. Um, and so it, it takes everybody working with a sense of urgency every single day to make sure we're addressing the challenges, we're breaking down the barriers, we're setting um, a, a consistent message of, of high expectations across the district for behaviors, for teaching and learning, um, for um, 
working with families, making sure that families are part of this process is so, so important. And um, so I think it's creating that culture of high expectations across the district. And uh, one issue that kind of cuts across a couple of those, cuts across the discipline and the academic, and a movement that we're seeing across country, is banning cell phones mm -hmm. in the schools. Have in the schools or in the classroom? I'm sorry, do what? In the school or in the classroom? In the classroom. Okay. Well, yeah. well, basically, we're talking about one, yeah, uh, in the classroom. Because I think there's a big, big difference. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Have you thought about that? Well, we, well actually, we had a, um, uh, a, a school, school discipline uh, planning meeting uh, several, several days ago, and that was one of the topics that came up. In fact, actually, this afternoon, I'm making, meeting with uh, Dr. Ron Branch, our um, su assistant superintendent over pupil services, to talk about that topic uh, because it's been brought up. It's been um, uh, concerns from uh, board members, concerns from the community, concerns from, the, from principals. And this is not this is not new though. Um, right. This is not a new challenge. Um, and in my experience, um, I've seen I've seen where cell phone policies within schools work well. I've seen some where the best intentions are laid out, but it's not followed with fidelity, and so it breaks down and it becomes more of a, a you know lip service, I guess. Um, so I think the most important thing is is that whatever we establish needs to be consistently applied across the district, um, and so uh, making sure that um, as we create that policy uh, for Berkeley County, that we have the right stakeholders at the table to help flesh out the the expectations, and then and then um, and then we follow it. I do think that when it comes to addressing you know behaviors in schools, that cell phones and social media are the, the, the biggest influencers in causing disruptions. And so I think that making sure that our students uh, develop skills in responsible uh, um, digital citizenship, whether that be for social media or for use of devices during instructional time is extremely important. And I think it also comes back to that culture of high expectations. So whatever the cell phone policy is, whether it's uh, you know, from one extreme of you can have them, uh, just don't use them during instructional time, and you monitor drop it. Drop them in a basket when you come in. Drop right. them in a basket, put them in the the the, the tub. Yeah. Um, you know, or to a complete ban. It it really comes back to the culture of high expectations and doing what we've said we're going to do in order to follow policy. And will you get input from parents on policy like that? Is that it's is that something that you will open it up to to the public to, to weigh in on? Um, I, I will tell you that, so we have a committee, and that committee has, has uh, the discipline committee, and there's, yeah. there's, there's parents on that committee, I believe. Right. But um, if there are not, I would definitely want to have some family stakeholders at right. the table with that process, absolutely. We've got about 60 seconds. Um, I'm going to take it from a 6,000 feet above, how do you, and I, I guess we can address this next, but how do you, how do you uh, look at test scores and the actual, I, I know our schools aren't as bad as the test scores say they are, right? right? So how do you make that disconnect not be disconnected anymore? And I know that's a, a tough question to answer in 60 seconds, but I, I'm going to give you a shot. Well, there's, listen, there's awesome learning opportunities and learning activities going on in Berkeley County schools every day. I, I, I don't have to, I haven't, I haven't been in schools yet during instruction, right? but I know Berkeley County schools well enough to know that we have some absolutely awesome, awesome teachers. I mean, Brian Holt, our teacher of the year for, for Berkeley County schools is a prime example. He's a, he's a finalist for teacher of the year. The state assessment scores are the rule. Yeah. We have to recognize that. Yeah. And we can't dismiss it. That has to be the barometer at which we're assessing ourselves each year. We will have other assessment points through um, our resources, through diagnostics and through uh, progress monitoring and learning that we can use to say students are growing in, in their achievement. But we have to continue to measure ourselves based upon those state assessment results. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk. Dr. Ron Sachs joins us. My co-host, Bill Stubblefield, Maria Lawrenson. We're going to continue for this uh, last half hour. Um, 
Bill, you had... Been a half hour? It's already been a half hour, oh, right? I felt like it was like 10 or 15 minutes. I know. Minutes. So it, that, it, what, time flies. It time flies when, you, when you're on the mic, <laughs> when you're making mistakes all day. <laughs> um, so, so looking from a, a, a state level, uh, what would you like to see, and, and let's just put it out there, what would you like to see the legislature or the Board of Education at the state level change in West Virginia that would help education? Locality pay. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're you're already a Berkeley County, right? That's right. So, so obviously, locality pay is 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 one of those things we all champion here. But um, I, I'm talking at a uh, in school discipline. Is it, it what, what is it that what red tape between the district and the uh, state needs to change? You know, I think that a significant amount of work has already been accomplished. Um, giving you know uh, more f more flexibility to school districts to be able to look at even you know the state funding formula um, yep. opening up certain items to have flexibility like um, even in the in the transportation line item you know to be able to, to, to have more flexibility in how you meet the needs of your students um, so I think I think that, that there's a lot of, of so local control if you will absolutely okay. yes uh, because um, legislating from Charleston as to what should happen in Berkeley, you know, just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of, of significant improvements have already been made in that, in that regard. Um, I do think that the state funding formula could be uh, improved upon in order for school districts to have the necessary resources to meet the needs of our students. Obviously, you know, being able to um, uh, allocate um, I think a greater level of, of resources or even um, when it comes to the, the number of certified staff that you should be allowed to have, taking into consideration special education population, you know, um, being able to um, have greater staffing in those areas, obviously mental health. You know, uh, they, uh, several years ago, there was a, the, the omnibus bill that did put in more positions for counselors and social workers and those sort of things. But we also need more nurses. You know, we need to be able to have more nurses, you know, and, and that the state aid reflect that. Um, Berkeley is actually kind of also interesting because of, again, it comes back to making sure that we're meeting the, the needs of our special education students, but with transportation, that um, we actually cap out at our reimbursement. And so I think lifting the cap for state aid reimbursement on transportation costs, school bus replacement, those types of things could be very, very helpful. Um, and so uh, I have a couple other things that I've, I've been ruminating on, and uh, maybe if there's another opportunity once we're well, you, you, about this. And you and I will be meeting, uh, I think, this, this afternoon. afternoon. So, yeah, um, yeah we'll go over the, a lot of that stuff. Uh, why do you think, um, and again, I'm just trying to be broad here. Uh, I know you've only been on the, the job two weeks. Why do you think there's such a growing population of special needs kids within Berkeley County? It, it seems like our population of special needs kids has grown exponentially over the last 10 years mm -hmm. well um it's not it's not only berkeley yeah <laughs> it's it's a statewide na it's really a national trend i think yeah. I, I think that um i think that there's several things i think social media is is a huge huge player in being able to regulate emotions regulate and you know we're not talking about just cognitive disabilities yeah. we're yeah. talking about behavior disorders and yeah. those sort of things um that you know the the have we have we painted it with a too broad of a brush is is no, because I really don't, because I do think that we, we recognize that we have some, you know, students that do need additional assistance, and they meet the, they meet the uh, definition of, of requiring special education services. I think maybe it's also that we have a better understanding of what some of these disorders are that maybe were not always... Um, uh, understood in the past. And yeah, so, like 70s and yeah. 80s. That went yeah. on, you know, I want to say I my mother-in-law was a, a middle school teacher math for like 30 years and it was sort of, you know, the boys who were disruptive in the classroom was like, well, you know, they're going to grow out of it and well, I yeah. learned and as a whooped. teacher how to deal yeah. with that, yeah. you know, so yeah, I don't I mean, know. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I think, you know, we also have a... Um, 
I think we have a mindset that there's a moral imperative that we have as educators to make sure that we're meeting the needs of every single student. And if you look at what graduation rates were like at, you know, 20, 30 years ago compared to where they are now, we're not giving up on kids. Right. And so if there's if they have to be identified in order to get them the services they need, then that's what we have to be able to do. And and then we have to provide those services. But those services do come at a at a at a cost that I don't think is completely reflected. You know, the federal government provides um, IDEA funding, but it has never been fully funded. It's only funded at like 15%. And so I think looking at fully funding, um, and that's a, that's a federal thing, that's, yeah, not, yeah. that's not state, but um, I think that those are some, probably some of the areas that we could use some significant assistance with. The other thing is school safety. Um, you know, uh, Making sure that we have, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, school safety personnel in place, we don't get reimbursed. There is no, there's no accounting of that in the state, in the state aid. Um, and so that is on the, the local district to be able to provide. Um, and so, you know, obviously you have your high school resource officers in Berkeley. We're moving to middle school um, safety officers. But, you know, I, I fundamentally think that the cost of Providing a a um, safe learning environment is that every school should have that at some point, and so I think we have to work in that direction. But that is that is an unfunded. There's no there's no real resource for that. It's you're you're trying to do more with the same amount of funding that you've always had. How about hardening the schools? Is that is that funded? Uh, uh, no, no. Okay. Now the school board, the school building uh, um, authority sometimes we'll fund you know safe school entrances and actually um in Cabell, one of the things that we accomplished over the last seven years is um we were able to make sure that every single school had a safe school entrance by the end of actually this coming school year uh with some of the new buildings that were being built and the bond in berkeley also did the exact same thing i think it yeah, yeah. I was gonna and say so that. and all of those safe school entrances i believe are actually completed or they're nearing completion yeah and so that's part of hardening but it's also about it comes back it comes back to expectation it comes back to expectation and that is is making sure that what we've said we're going to do to keep our school safe we're going to content you know do are all the doors locked during the school day we're not propping doors open through with rocks we're not we're, we're making sure that we're um, keeping our egresses, you know, open from, you know, a clutter. And so having, uh, and, and we have a great safety team, uh, Dr. Branch and his team, I was actually asking for some of those reports uh, yesterday, actually. You know, they're going through and they're sort of auditing schools on a, on a basis to see, make sure that those things are being done. The Capitol Police now has the program where there's someone who comes and, and does another level of monitoring to make sure we're doing what we need to do to keep our, our campuses safe. Um, are we following the protocols when someone comes in that we're, you know, checking their background? Are we making sure that the people that are coming in our, our schools each day are the people that should be there? Um, so it's, again, it's about following those processes to keep kids safe as well. So so we were talking a little bit off the air, and I asked you uh, this question. I asked if I could ask, uh, you worked in Florida in the, in, the, in the education system, and you've worked in West Virginia biggest difference between the two education systems because Florida is looked at as one of the leaders in, in, in the country correct? yeah so I think the, probably the biggest thing is um, you know from an operational standpoint yeah. is um, how uh, you hire and evaluate your staff um, you know in, in Florida um, everybody's an annual employee where in West Virginia um, you're you're uh, you're sort of seniored if you if you will you have continuing contracts and of course there's um, you know school you know if if there's a uh, a situation with an employee you know they go through an improvement plan process and so on and so forth in Florida there there wasn't as much of that um, the other thing in Florida that, that um, existed was and, and West Virginia is actually replicating this now was they required every third grader to be reading by third grade and so, isn't that amazing I know yeah who, who would have thought that we should be <laughs> striving for that and I think that um, well I know that the third grade success act of West Virginia it is mirrors that a lot yeah um and putting in the place for those students that have not mastered the the reading level about third grade the um the interventions to help them be caught up so that they can transition to fourth grade we have some of those things in place now not all of them are funded 
and yep. you know it's like summer like the summer school that needs to be provided um, those types of things but there are things in place that we're working toward to make sure that we can um, make sure that every single student in Berkeley County is on grade level by third grade and in if they're not then we're going to put in some very meaningful interventions to, and work with families to help them acquire those skills. So staffing is always an issue, um, clearly. And, you know, in Berkeley County, perhaps even more so than other places, one of the, not criticisms, but one of the challenges, I think, is just having certified teachers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how many non-certified folks you're going to have to have in classrooms this coming school year just to be able to staff? Yeah, so um, I, right now we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 150, uh, 150 positions that um, are unfilled. And so we are working through, we think that we'll be able to close that gap. Um, we're going to definitely have some long-term subs in the positions in order to ensure that we have every classroom covered. Um, and some of those long-term subs are certified because they're retirees or what have you, but uncertified, I do not have that number quite yet, I, but I will provide that for you. Okay. Um, and in fact, one of the things that, that I do is um, during my superintendent's update with the board, Mr. S Dr. Schooley, our, our HR assistant superintendent provides updates on that as well. So we'll make sure we have that, that data available. Um, Excuse me, out of the 150 you mentioned, what's the demographics of that? Is it biased towards special needs, high school, middle school, elementary, or what? Um, most of them are um, uh, special education and um, um, actual, education te actual and teachers or aides. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, do what? Te like, teachers or aides or both? Well, both. both. Okay. So we have... So we have um, uh, pre K, we have pre K special need um, aids um, that we have a shortage of, and then we also have um, like our autism teachers. That, that's another one that, that we have a shortage of. And then, of course, you know, across the board, we have you know shortage of math, science, so you know all the whole the whole gamut. But that's where we see the most issue in being able to fill those positions. And so, one of the things that we're doing this year is is that um, for those people that are uncertified or in those they're in those long term positions, we have uh, teacher mentors that will be coaching them, working with them, you know, uh, weekly to make sure that they have the resources, they have the training, they have the embedded support um, to be able to provide the best, the best, the best education possible. I will also say, you know, be, having a certified teacher is so so important. It's a it's it's a crux of what you have to be able to have. But we have some really really good non certified people that have a lot of knowledge and experience. We just need to make sure that they they um, develop the instructional strategy to be able to cover that content. And so, um, you know, the, if if the will is there, that's half of the, That's half of it. And then, of course, we have alternative certified teaching pathways that we can work with those people. That if they start and they're not certified, we can put them on a path to become a certified teacher um, with very high quality um, professional development and coursework. To um, and how is that? How is that done? Right. Well, there's it, it, there's different there's different ways you can, and um, so, so you can have a, a, a county based program that you put people through that. And do we do we have a county based program? I, yes, I believe okay. we do. Okay. I believe we do. I don't know much about it yet, um, but we had the exact same thing in Cabell. It was a very robust two year program, um, and but then you can also go through a, a program with the state. Um, many colleges and universities also offer, um, while you're on the job, uh, coursework that will help like you become camp. certified. Yeah, <laughs> it's like boot camp. So there's, there's. Well, they can still do the teaching, but take the classes mm -hmm. and get certified. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah. So there's different, there's several different avenues, um, and uh, I do think that the one of the best is is when you can do it within the county with the resources you have that is certified by the state. Um, of course, obviously monitored by the state as well for right. compliance purposes. But uh, we've done that in Cabell. The same thing in, in Manatee, Florida. Um, we had a, a non, uh, an uncertified teaching program that was, um, we call it the alternative certification pathway, and it works out very well. 
I think Maria has a question earlier than yeah. I. I have one I'd like to <laughs> And he's going to defer to me. Yeah. Um, so you talked about um, about the board having a sense of urgency. And again, you're 18 days in, what have you. One of the board members, Melissa Power, was on this show last week. And one of the things that she talked about that she thought was necessary was that a superintendent have fear um, for the board, of the board. I think that's right. Um, and we didn't get a whole lot of time to sort of press her on that, but do you fear your board of education? Well, I, here, here's what I fear. Um, I fear letting the community down. I fear letting our teachers down and our students down. And of course, that's, that, that's inclusive of our board. Um, you know, I, uh, I have a moral imperative to do the very best job that I can every single day. I'll, I'll also share with you that um, I try to have a Christian worldview as, as to how I lead. Um, and um, I, I have this, this sense of moral imperative to do the very best job. And if something doesn't go the right way or we falter in a place, you know, I, I fear letting our, our students and our families down. But what I will also say is, is that I have a deep respect for every single board member um, that I ever work with, even if we have disagreements on, on something, um, because I think that we are all working toward the same goal. And um, it's OK to disagree, um, but we have to be able to respect each other. Um, and, and sometimes it's about finding common ground. Sometimes we're, we're maybe not always going to agree on it, but we need to be able to continue to have a level of, of, of respect. And, you know, I work for the board. Um, they are, you know, my supervisors, if you will. Um, and there are five different board members with um, five different personalities. But what one, the one thing that does unite us and, and is common among us all is, is that we want the very best for Berkeley County. And so um, uh, I, I think that, that there has to be a level of respect from the superintendent and the board, the district staff with the board, our teachers, our administrators, and the board, um, because again, the board is elected by the community, and we Absolutely. need to make sure that um, what it is that they're looking out for the community is, is that, that that is our perspective in being able to meet the needs of our students. Yeah, within the school system, there are several 600-pound gorillas, and uh, we've talked about several of them today. One that we started off with the uh, show this morning was that of homeschoolers. Not so much the concept, but the way that the dollars follow homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. Is that a a major concern of you as a superintendent of losing those dollars uh, away from bricks and mortar? Well, let me, let me first say that um, I believe families should have choices. Um, I, I absolutely believe that families should have choices of where they want to send their children. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, I try to have a, a Christian worldview as to as to how I lead. Um, but my wife and I, you know, we are a faith based family. Um, we value um, uh, Christian principles for our student, for our children. And, um, you know, so I, I understand the desire when when, you know, private school is is, uh, is a goal for a family uh, so that they can maybe have a faith based education. Uh, that's something that we value for our kids. And then, of course, you know, um, maybe it's it's because you want your child to go to a certain public school yeah. or even homeschool. I'm talking about the dollars. Specific. Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, and. So with that context, I'll also say, though, that I think choice should not be at the expense of dollars that flow through the public school system for our public school students. I think public school dollars should go toward public school students and their and, and family resources um, and, you know, valuing the opportunity for choice of families should not be at the expense of the dollars flowing to our public schools. But so you're, it's a pure numbers suggesting. thing, is it not? What's I mean, that? it's a pure numbers thing. So if a student opts, if a parent opts to either homeschool or to send their child to private school utilizing the Hope Scholarship, that's one body that's no longer in public schools. So that reimbursement piece gets taken out of 
the the and public only, group. It's only correct? the state part of the yeah. three. Oh, so I, so. Okay, we're okay, about, we're sorry, about to confuse sorry. everything. Okay. The Hope Scholarship is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the money monies that follow a student from the public school to a home school. That, that or doesn't matter. No, that's school. not that, that's the only way they can get money is through the Hope Scholarship. Yeah. There's no money coming out unless they a apply for the Hope Scholarship. And but that but I understand that the Hope Scholarship has been funded separately by the legislators. That's what Eric Carr said the other day. But there's also but, but that child is moving from the school, so the school doesn't get funded for that child. So, so that's how that transition is working. So within 45 days, correct me if I'm wrong, your enrollment is checked and Berkeley County gets based on the state aid formula, based on starting with number of students. And that's how much money gets funneled to <coughs> Berkeley County. If a child goes to a, uh, a homeschool, they're not counted in the enrollment. So that's where it's gone. Now, that child doesn't have to apply for the Hope Scholarship, but if they do, that is funded through the legislature. Separate. Yes. So that's how it kind of works. So there's no actual money. It, it, they do lose when somebody chooses to go to private school or to, yeah. to home school. But, now, but in Berkeley County's case, we're the, one of the few that have increasing enrollment. So their yeah. budget goes up usually every year. A yeah. lot of lot, like capitals probably went down every year. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it... it Technically. Technically it went down, but when the state pay raises came in, yes. you get more money, but it's, you know, it's offset. But to answer your question, the, the, the challenge is, is that when you incentivize through yeah. public dollars that could affect the FTE that a school district has, then, you know, your school district budget is affected by that. Yeah. Yes, that that's was my basic question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what you got a chance here to just give a, your elevator speech. We've only got like three minutes left, believe it or not. Wow. Um, what can you... Uh, promise to Berkeley County or what can you uh, assure Berkeley County parents and, and citizens that you will bring to the table over the next uh, couple, few years? Um, what, first of all, I think that it's m one of the most important things that I, I want to convey is, is that um, as superintendent, my goal is, is to make sure that Berkeley County Schools is the premier school district, uh, not only in the state, but in the region. And we, we do that by working with our stakeholders. Uh, making sure that we listen to to the needs of um, what our teachers are saying, what our families are saying, and that we um, develop a culture of high expectations for learning um, and that as we work to make sure that every single student walks across the stage being college, career, or military enlistment ready, that um, that the skills that they're receiving um, are are of the highest caliber, and um, there's there's also um, the importance of making sure that as we accomplish that, that we communicate with our families, we're transparent with how our dollars are flowing, and um, that the work we're doing each and every single school day. Um, is uh, for our kids. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan Sachs, joining us. We will be right back after this. Hi, Crescia Hornby here. Larry DeMarco, broker of my